me high in my basement, ocean in my pipes, no trust fund in the 215. Welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm Alex Ames, and this is Season 1, Books and Bitters, Adventures in Book Collecting, in which we explore the stories behind fascinating objects in the Rosenbach's collection, and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day life. This episode is titled, Artifacts of Inspiration, Authorship, Activism, and the Archive, a conversation with Philadelphia Poets Laureate Trapita Mason and Yolanda Wisher. The first pluck will have you hooked. Gliding on her slick strings, longing for strumming. Tapping that rigid neck. So much power inlaid with grace. And you jump into that well of hollowed wood, that well from which all good things flow. So you're here now. It's jazz. As a repository of iconic literary manuscripts, important historical records, and many fascinating examples of the fine and decorative arts, the Rosenbach in Philadelphia is a place of inspiration for those who visit to do research, take a tour of our historic spaces, and participate in courses and programs. We often think of museums, libraries, and archives as stewards of cultural heritage, which they certainly are, and which is arguably the key role they play for our society. In this episode of the Rosenbach Podcast, I'm curious to learn more about how artifacts like those preserved at the Rosenbach can become sources of inspiration, both for new works of artistry and learning, and for activism in the civic realm. I'm joined today by two people well-positioned to help me learn more about this issue. Trapita B. Mason is the City of Philadelphia 2020 through 2021 Poet Laureate. She reads her poetry widely and works extensively, facilitating poetry and creative writing workshops. Mason's work sheds light on and honors the immigrant experience and amplifies the stories of everyday people. She is a recipient of a Pew Fellowship in Literature, a Leeway Transformation Award, a Leeway Art and Change Grant, and Pennsylvania Council on the Arts Grants. She is a Cave Canem and Kala Lu Fellow and a 2019 Aspen Words Emerging Writers Fellow with the Aspen Institute. Mason is the author of She Was Once Herself and Mocha Melodies. She has released two music and poetry projects, Scat and This Is How We Get Through, in collaboration with internationally acclaimed jazz guitarist Manette Sudler. Her other publications include submissions in the American Poetry Review, Epiphany Literary Journal, Aesthetica Magazine, and Margie, the American Journal of Poetry. Mason is a native of Liberia and is a graduate of Temple University, Bryn Mawr Graduate School of Social Work and Social Research, and Villanova University School of Business. Currently working in the social services field, she is also a member of several local organizations where she uses the arts to mobilize, build community, and create change. She sits on the Rosenbach's Board of Trustees. Yolanda Wisher is a public poet, two-time Philadelphia Poet Laureate, and the author of Monk Eats an Afro. She performs poetry and song with her band, The Afro Eaters, and creates radical educational and community experiences like the School of Guerrilla Poetics, an activist training program for poets. She currently works as the Curator of Spoken Word at Philadelphia Contemporary, where she produces the podcast Love John's A Mixtape. Wisher also sits on the Board of Trustees of the Rosenbach and helped convene the Community Advisory Committee for the Rosenbach's recent digital exhibition, I Am an American, The Authorship and Activism of Alice Dunbar Nelson. Trapita and Yolanda, thank you both so much for joining me on the Rosenbach podcast. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'd like to begin the interview by learning a bit more about the two of you and what led you both to become involved with the Rosenbach. Yolanda, I've had the opportunity uh, to work with you on the Rosenbach exhibition, I Am an American, The Authorship and Activism of Alice Dunbar Nelson, and attend one of your rent party programs. Can you tell me a bit more about your background as an artist and how you became part of the Rosenbach community? Sure. I, um, 
I've been a poet since I've been a little girl. And I've found ways to be a poet, I think, that have been outside of the conventional ways of showing up as a poet. Very particularly trying to be a poet who works in community settings and uses poetry as a tool for change um, wherever I see that it's needed. And um, that led me to being a poet laureate, uh, which is, I think, a way that you can be of service as a poet. And the poet laureate work led me to the Rosenbach, um, where I was invited to share my work, but also to tour the space and to become acquainted with the collection. And I fell in love with a copy of Phyllis Wheatley's first book. And that was my, my welcome into the space and to the potential of what I could do there um, on the board side but also in terms of the programming and what we're offering to the Philadelphia community from this amazing collection. Trapita, our paths first crossed several months ago at a program sponsored by the Philadelphia organization Women in Transition, which sponsors an annual poetry reading called Amplifying Our Voices to celebrate the stories of survivors of intimate partner violence. The Rosenbeck had partnered on several programs with Women in Transition as part of our digital exhibition I Am an American, which I mentioned earlier. This leads me to two questions for you. First, what role can the arts play in empowering people to lead fulfilling lives? And second, what role do you think organizations like the Rosenbach have in helping people explore their artistic and cultural interests? Yeah, so I think, you know, I'm going to start with the the last part. I think institutions like the Rosenbach and um, others around our city are really essential um, because for artists in particular, it offers access to materials and information that can really spark our creativity, but also can help us engage with communities in a different way. You know, my involvement with the Rosenbach was before becoming a board member, it was through teaching, and it was through teaching a class with Yolanda. And that was really the first time I was able to see how much is really there, how much raw and rich material Uh, that you can use to create programming, you can inform, you can learn, you can, and so there's so much there. So I think these institutions are really necessary Um, at a time like this. People have been saying that a lot at a time like this, but really for for any time and every time. Um, In terms of the artists and the role that, that, you know, we play in particular, I would play, uh, my, my work is embedded in community practice. But in within the community practice, it is also essential that I have tools. For me, uh, I you know we, the blue SI. I know there's a galley proof there in the um, Rosenbach, and when I learned about that, I was just elated. And also, I think there's also another new Tony Morrison acquisition. So being able to have those tools at our disposal um, is just invaluable. And I think as you can spark learning and teaching and community engagement. Yolanda, for listeners of the Rosenbach podcast who have not yet visited the Rosenbach in person, how would you describe the place to them? You know, sometimes when I'm trying to describe the Rosenbach or pique people's interest, I say it's this old house museum in a part of Rittenhouse Square you've probably never seen or heard about or had a chance to go inside of. And it's a place that has some really cool books and antiques. Um, If I want to get a little bit more poetic about it, I describe it as a portal into the past through rare books and objects, you know, that there's a succession of portals that you kind of enter into when you enter the, the Rosenbach. There's that front door of just coming into the building, but every single object in that space, in that building is, is a pathway into the past that's not necessarily something you've learned about in a textbook or as part of your college education. Um, It may be something that's completely related to our history and our present, but these are some of those off the beaten paths that you can explore just by walking in that door. 
Trapita, you're very active in Philadelphia's cultural life, and as I already mentioned, you did recently join the Rosenbach's board of directors. Do you think the Rosenbach is unique in any way within the wider context of Philadelphia's art and culture scene, which is so vast and, and diverse? If so, what, what makes the Rosenbach different and unique? Yeah, I do think it's different and unique. Um, I, I kind of, I'm always going to come from the programming end of things, and one of the things that the Rosenbach offers is a variety, a wide range of programming. Um, and I think more recently, I think the Rosenbach has also expanded its reach. By that, I mean just expanding its reach into other ways of creatively looking at things. I think you had mentioned earlier the rent parties that Yolanda has. But I know also there's, you know, on the behind the scenes and the, and the, um, looking at, you know, the Dracula program and other programs that have happened at the Rosenbach. I like to look at it as something for everyone. In other cultural institutions that we have, um, they tend to be limited to what's there. And that's the beauty about artifacts and ephemera and books. There's so much of a range and a variety that you can engage so many communities, particularly as the Rosenbach expands its wings to be able to collect and archive and cherish and save um, and works that are from, you know, other cultures that have not traditionally been represented. So I think that that's the big difference, the fact that there's a variety, there's a range, and there's a willingness um, to be inclusive in the collecting and also in the engaging. Yolanda, do you have a favorite book, manuscript, or other artifact in the Rosenbach's collection that inspires you? If so, what is it and why does it speak to you so profoundly? I love this question. I could probably answer it every six months. Um, every went party, I feel like I fall in love with a new object at the Rosenbach. Um, so I'd probably say every every object that inspired a rent party, <laughs> my first answer. And then my second would be like a, an actual space in the Rosenbach. The Marianne Moore room is really inspiring to me. I'm still in awe that a writer's room could be transplanted from one state to another and into a building, that a, a space that a writer um, occupied and lived in and loved um, could be embodied here in Philadelphia. And every time I get a chance to walk in that space, it, it acquaints me very intimately with a poet who, I'm, who I've never met. Um, but who I know, who I get to know through the objects that she collected in her office. And it makes me think about my own office and what will live on beyond me and my own, the own, my own wish for my writing space and the spaces that I create around myself as a poet to be both public and private in the ways that that room feels to me. You know, there are more visits I could make to that room to discover all of the possibilities in there. Um, and so that's, that will be one of my favorites for a while. Trapita, how about you? Do you have a favorite book, manuscript, or other object in the Rosenbach collection that inspires you? And if so, what strikes you so much about it? Well, I love hearing about the room and the, what, what writers choose to keep and preserve and what people choose to remember them by, how they set up a room. <laughs> I really enjoyed hearing that. For me, I had mentioned earlier about the galley proof, and then recently there is uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved, I may be getting it wrong, but I, I know there is um, some addition or uncorrected um, uh, addition. And I love um, so many things in the Rosenbach, but I think the biggest ones for me are the works that were, you know, before they were published. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, even as I look at my own process, um, that what was the you know, the writer thinking about at that moment, where did the writer want this work to go? I love the fact that we're not only collecting, you know, works that have been finished, but also works that were in various stages by writers, um, and particularly African-American um, writers, one like Toni Morrison. It makes me imagine. Um, and of course, I think about preservation and preserving, archiving, um, what the Rosenbach inspires for me through these different pieces is really thinking about the writers that we adore today, um, even us as we're writer, writing. Um, what are we going to preserve? Um, what's going to be stored? What's going to be kept? And I think that's, that's, so it's more of a feeling of the Rosenbach than an actual, um, 
you know, besides the bullet's eye um, and an actual artifact, uh, because it, it, it lends, I think it just lends itself to asking a, a, just a lot of questions about your, the writing life and who you are as a writer. I really love the idea of thinking about the collection at the Rosenbach as a record of the creative process, because virtually all of our artifacts, the rare books, of course, the manuscripts, archival records, and you know, fine and decorative arts speak to precisely what you both are talking about, this idea of preserving the, the record of creation uh, in all these different media. So that's a really profound way to look at our holdings. Yolanda, you work with a lot of writers, musicians, and visual artists who are not only talented in their artistic specialties of focus, but care deeply about their communities and actively work for social good and for social change. Based on your observations of your colleagues, as well as your own work in these areas, how would you describe the role of the arts in civic life? Thinking about American life in general in 2021, what is the role of the arts in our culture? And in an ideal world, what would the role of the arts be? You know, I think when I look at my friends and peers, I think our primary role as artists is to remain optimistic and to to remain positive, to remain hopeful, um, because we keep doing what we do, <laughs> despite the challenges that we encounter, despite whether or not it seems anyone cares about the work you're producing, um, or whether or not you, you live, you get to live to see the changes that you want to see in the world. It really is about uh, betting on the future, I think, art, and also not caring about, um, not caring too much about the present, <laughs> perhaps. Um, I also think for me, art forms like poetry and music, they, they contain something of the collective sigh or the, the cosmic yelp that we might be all feeling at any given moment in the world, that there's a way that um, these art forms hold that, preserve that, uh, bear witness to that, and that artists are the bridge between these interior spaces that we still have yet to figure out inside of ourselves and the world that we walk through every day in our daily lives. Um, we get to make sense of that, that movement that we're all doing every single day, every moment. We mark that for people and reflect that. And I think ultimately what we are doing is creating communities that are our chosen families. Um, and they're communities that may be more of what we, more the things that, more of like the world we want to live in. Um, they are more the ideal worlds and the, the ideal ways we'd like to be in humanity with one another, um, in community with one another. Trapita, in your biography at the top of the episode, I mentioned that you are both a poet and a social worker, and in your work you combine the arts with social activism. How do you see the connection between poetry and social work? And I'm wondering, what was it like uh, earlier in your career to bring these different areas of focus together into sort of one social enterprise? I do really have to pause there because I wished uh, earlier in my career I didn't fret so much about wanting to do one or the other. And I would say that was really a big part of, you know, my growing up as a poet and as a person who works in this field. I really just wanted to be an artist. And that was the big thing for me. Um, although I, I had a pull, a pulling from my heart also to be involved in helping to, you know, help people to change different ways about themselves and their lives. And that's what social work does. But then it was later on when I kind of got this eureka moment <laughs> where it, it felt like um, it really the two, if one informs the other, you know, uh, being a social worker and being a writer, it really does inform the other. Um, and for me, I've kind of made peace with that. Um, so right now I use the two tools. I may not always... Um, it may not be as, you know, obvious in what I'm doing, but even in the act of engaging with others, in the act of being in this community of writers and creative people, 
um, where we are supporting each other. And I love the term Yolanda used about this, this cultivating joy and optimism. You really need to be able to reach back on some of these other clinical skills sometimes to be able to see you through. In writing workshops, in community engagements and activities, um, I'm pulling both of those things. I try very hard to study the craft of poetry and to be able to refine and, and work on my writing as I grow older. Um, but I also, in my social work life, as I'm learning tools to be able to turn it into, um, as you put it, you know, more of an enterprise and not look at it as one or the other. So I'm really happy that I've been able to merge the two. Um, there isn't a day that goes by whether I'm using poetry or I am using uh, my social work skills that I'm not leaning on the other. And the poetry, um, it's a, a therapeutic way for me to get through the day-to-day -day grind as well. Um, and then with the social work, I'm engaging with so many communities and individuals and learning how to be creative about that engagement. So uh, I will, I'm, I can happily say that I'm at peace <laughs> uh, with both of those things in my life right now. Yolanda, I titled this podcast episode, Artifacts of Inspiration. Can you tell me a little bit about the creative process that you've uh, deployed on two of your major projects at the Rosenbach, uh, the rent parties that we've discussed a bit uh, over the course of this conversation and your new album, and maybe give a sense of, uh, to, to listeners who haven't been to a rent party, what exactly a rent party at the Rosenbach is and the kinds of uh, performance and interpretation involved in that uh, particular program. So a rent party at the Rosenbach is quite an experience um, for the folks who are putting it on and also the, the people who are invited, you know, who de decide to be our audience for that evening. Um, you know, the rent party is based on the old re rent parties from the 20s and 30s and probably even before then of, um, you know, that first experience of folks living in cities, having to pay rent and make the rent and finding a creative way, like host hosting a party where you could hear great music and maybe some poetry as a way to, you know, gather up enough funds to pay that month's rent. And so, you know, thinking of the rent party as an event blueprint, an event form that we could use in a place like the Rosenbach, which is at the basic level of house. Um, when I started thinking about what we could do as a program in that space that would uplift black and brown voices in the collection, I thought about the rent party as a container for that exploration um, because it was so congregational and also so radical in the sense that it almost implied being in a prohibition era kind of um, time period that it came about in and also being kind of underground, that it was pushing boundaries already uh, that we could use to think about how the art that we were presenting could also push boundaries. And I think ultimately the rent party is a, starts with a conversation with the collection um, and the ancestors in particular that I've been drawn to in those collections, um, particularly African-American voices uh, and African-American stories and trying to, find a way to listen to what the work in the collection is trying to tell me today and how as an artist, a poet, and as a musician, I can respond and also invite my band um, as other artists to respond. And also the rent parties involve other poets. I invite uh, in a, two poets from different poetic lineages to share their work and to to respond to the theme, that part of the collection that we're highlighting, that rent party. So it's about conversation. It's about collaboration. It's about inviting a wider group of people into the conversation with ancestors. And I think it's a lot about what I love about, like, say, the illuminated manuscripts um, of somebody like William Blake or, you know, when you see something really precious and gilded. Um, I feel like that's what we're doing in some way. We're illuminating these parts of the collection with performance and with voice and with music and sometimes literally breathing new life into them, um, resurrecting them. 
Trapita, what role do libraries and museums play in civic life, and what more do they need to do as institutions to make their resources accessible and meaningful for the communities they they serve and the communities they want to serve? Yeah, in uh, libraries, museums, they play a a crucial role in civic life, Um, and particularly when they have made a commitment to honor that community or those communities of which they're a part of, um, and not exist as an island unto themselves. Um, Libraries, uh, museums should be also involved in the active work of cultivating, archiving, honoring the community members' stories and the civic life, just to, you know, whether it's in that town or the city, Um, and they should be living, breathing places. They should not be um, places where, you know, you, you find some places where you go and you see one or two people are going in, and, you know, and they're just looking through and finding, you know, acad- academic materials. Um, and then you've seen some museums that have been able to really build a, 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 an invested community engagement process where people are coming in and they have a sense of ownership. This belongs to us because our stories are stored here. I think more and more um, museums and libraries have to be active citizens, you know, engage with, with the, uh, we, we, I, I think for a long time, they've maybe shied away from current issues, um, you know, um, really trying to stay on the periphery. And I, and I think what communities are saying is you can really no longer do that. So whether it's what we're collecting, the books that are on our shelves, the stories that we're holding sacred, and wanting to include the narratives that will go, you know, the the, the, the community stories. Um, those are all really, those, those are the stories that should be just as important as what are in those vaults, in those libraries and museums. And a lot of people are doing it well, um, and some could do it better. Um, and I think right now in particular, there's such an important time to collect stories to honor those stories and to create space to store that, but also to open those doors really wide and let community members know you can come in here um, and you can find something, you know, there is something for you that will validate you and and your story. I'm a big fan of um, both books and um, the archiving uh, of materials and stories. um, And I just feel like you can always do more. And, and reach out to these um, communities a lot more. My final question of this interview is really more of a request that I'm going to make of the both of you. Trapita and Yolanda, I would love to ask you both to read a poem that you've written that reflects some of the themes we've been discussing today, the connections between artistry, identity, and our city and nation's civic life. Trapita, let's start with you. I think I'm going to um, read just a short piece. And this was a piece that um, I had put on the um, the Healing Verse poetry line the first time around. It's a piece called In This Season. Um, and, I, and I'm reflecting on it because we've been talking about the roles of museums and places like the Rosenbach in, in the lives of individuals. But particularly, we've been talking about what it means to be creative at this time. Uh, Yolanda used the word optimism and joy and the things that we have to cultivate. So this short poem just is sort of an answer to that, that we're all doing the very best we can under these circumstances. So um, it's a poem called In This Season. In this season of naming and of holding space for the quieted and the muted to be amplified, In this season of shifting, of barrier breaking, undoing, unearthing, uprising, leveling, you, beloved, may think yourself too small, may think your intentions and acts too slight, may think you are but a fragment, a mere atom in this place of stars and gazers. But what a world you are. What a sphere of shocking beauty and grace. Do you not see how your one song, one breath, one step, one voice, your one pause, one lift, one shout, one protest brought us here, keeps us here? You say that it's only a speck you offer, 
just a tiny bit, a smidge, a morsel. Do you not see the feast ahead it prepares? How even the remains have purpose, how it beckons all to your grand table, how it feeds us and fills us and expands. Friend, you are a balm in these prickly times. You are a vessel, a refuge, a respite. Trapita, that was beautiful. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Healing Verse hotline that you mentioned? Yeah, so the Healing Verse hotline is a 1-855-POEM-RX-2. And it's a line that um, is a part of my uh, Poet Laureate project. Um, it's the first part of a three-part project series. But it's a toll-free line, and individuals are able to call um every day, 24 hours a day, to hear an affirming poem. Uh, Everyone has their take on the type of affirming, but it's mostly geared toward healing. The project is grounded in mental well-being and supporting mental health awareness. It's a 92nd poem, and the authors are changed, the writers, every Monday. They're changed in the morning, and it goes for an an entire week. And um, there have been many famous uh, poets, including Ms. Yolanda Wisher, on the line, and um, many more to come. Um, so it's a lot of people have expressed to me that it's, it does offer them respite. It's a part of their morning routine or daily routine. And that's been really um, amazing. I struggled with, you know, COVID and being the poet laureate and how to reach people, knowing about access and lack of access. Everybody doesn't have a way to, you know, um, get on to Zoom or Teams or any of these platforms. So all you have to do is pick up a phone. And um, a lot of this, some of this was birthed out of a conversation I had with Yolanda early on when I first learned that I had become, was named Poet Laureate and uh, really proud of this project. And, and um, you know, we're keeping it going, you know, until, until the very end. Well, I hope that everyone who listens to this podcast episode, once it's released, will have the opportunity to call the hotline. And I'm sure that they will also uh, have enjoyed hearing that really moving verse that you read. So thanks again for sharing it. And Yolanda, how about you? I'd like to ask you to share a poem as well. Yes, I loved hearing Trapita's poem. Uh, It's one of my new favorites by her. And um, also really honored to be part of the Healing Verse Project. Uh, I think it was exactly what we needed uh, this past year. And I'm excited to see it continue. I'm going to share... I guess what I'll call a shady love poem, a sonnet for a cultural ancestor uh, who, as I was a Black Studies major in undergrad, and so I spent a lot of time with the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and also Marcus Garvey and a lot of other folks like Booker T. Washington. That was kind of the trinity of Black Studies work when I was a student. And... Um, I was always really interested in the personal lives of these these figures and how that impacted their scholarship. And um, I always found them to be unfailingly human um, and complex. And um, Du Bois in particular, I was interested in because he spent some auspicious years in Philly um, writing The Philadelphia Negro. And so this is kind of a, a mashup of all of my thoughts about Du Bois as a a literary ancestor. It's called From Imhotep's Kundalini. What thoughts I have of you tonight, Du Bois, of bodies rocked in mines and bombed in bark, our blanched arrival, seething with scandals mark. Nowadays, I peep you in the bean pie seller's poise. With that silhouette fit for bust or cameo, I can't always divine your debonair birth or your buku brain laboring like an earth in hallelujah's ether, somehow ducking death's blow. Sure sprung from Imhotep's kundalini, Stitch in white reconstructions, funeral shroud. Script in Philly dirges for the crying out loud. Cussing Garvey's name over martinis. Sometimes I wonder 
if you double agent on the page or mastermind of our ordered rage. Mm. Mm -hmm. I I know we're not supposed to be coming, right? (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's hard when uh, Alex keeps turning off the sound uh, because I'm doing, mm, mm. you know, we call in response over here. Alex. I know. I, feel you. <laughs> I wanted to throw some snaps up in here too, quite a few times. Yeah, I, I oh, won't interrupt God. you. I promise. No, no. Yeah. You know, cause a couple of times when Yolanda was taught, I was like, mm, mm, oh, that poem. Oh. and then I found myself saying, mm, you know, and I say, like, Oh, I'm, my mic is off, but Alex, we can, we need to be having some mm up in here. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> at, at, at didn't how <laughs> that was lovely the be the pasta oh man i'm uh, seeing yes i'm seeing it oh, beautiful thank you. beautiful thank you, thank you. Mm. i have to say listening to you both share your poetry i mean and in, in light of the conversation that we've had i mean it really makes me think about you know collections objects in new ways Mm -hmm. and this idea of approaching them to uncover humanity and think about how they speak to the present day i mean i just really feel transformed especially by hearing your verses so thank you both so much for sharing that with us today thank you for creating the space yeah thank you so nice to be able to hear poetry on a thursday afternoon yes indeed Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. The first four episodes of Season 1 have given you an introduction to our institution, our collection, and our community. The rest of the season will dive into fascinating stories found in our collection. Check back soon for more glimpses of the Rosenbach's remarkable rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, literature, and culture. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and we always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Memberships start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. Thank you for your support. If you enjoy the introductory and concluding music featured on the podcast, which was composed and performed by Yolanda Wisher and her band The Afro Leaders, and was recorded at WRTI 90.1 in Philadelphia for NPR Live Sessions, visit WRTI.org to learn more. Also, please consider purchasing Wisher's new album. Just visit Rosenbach.org for information. The interlude music featured in this episode comes from the album This Is How We Get Through by Monette Sudler and Trapita Mason. We heard Mason reading It's Jazz and Monette Sudler performing her music. If you visit rosenbach.org slash podcast, you'll find a link to their album, and I highly recommend you check it out. The Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast.